welcome back to the Dowie Podcast. My guest today is Shifu Jonathan Bluestein. Jonathan is the headmaster of Blue Jade Martial Arts, an international organization dedicated to preserving and promoting traditional Chinese Gong Fu. He's also the host of Jadecast, a podcast that features interviews with other martial arts teachers, as well as lectures by Shifu Bluestein on various topics, ranging from traditional Chinese medicine to martial culture. Shifu Bluestein is also a prolific author, having written numerous articles and several books, including The Martial Arts Teacher, A Practical Guide to a Noble Way, and Jonathan Bluestein's Research of the Martial Arts. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, for being here today. Pleasure to meet you. Yeah, pleasure is mine, Bill, and thank you for kindly having me. So just for uh, in case any of our viewers or listeners are not familiar with you, could we sort of get started with a bit of your early background? Uh, how did you get started or interested in the martial arts to begin with? Well, I suppose uh, a lot of martial artists sort of have it in them from a very early age. You know, I had this inclination, this tendency to pursue something martial. I could sort of feel it in my bones. When I was little, I was watching the ninja films, you know, trying to mimic their movements. And when I was a kid, I told my mom that I'd like to take some karate, karate classes. Oh. And uh, unfortunately, her being a, a good Jewish mom thought this was a, a tad too violent. So yeah. I had to wait until I was 16. Then I just decided to do whatever the, the hell I want to do. <laughs> and I just um, went and enrolled in a Western boxing gym under coach Ron Antal. Uh, he's a great fellow. I think nowadays uh, he primarily... Uh, coaches uh, boxing Muay Thai and MMA in Toronto. He's still at it. Great guy. So I was with him um, just slightly under two years. And then I enlisted, as uh, some people know in Israel, we do have a three-year mandatory service for men and two-year mandatory service for women. Right. I had my service uh, as a police investigator and interrogator of the Israeli police force. Um Soon after enlisting, uh, I, I, did, I had my boot camp with uh, an inf infantry brigade, the Golani Infantry Brigade, 13th Battalion. That was four, four and a half months. Then following that, I got with the Israeli police. Then I had uh, that more time on my hands. Um, and I got thinking, you know, well, uh, boxing was fun. And it was very challenging. It's, it's a great martial sport. I respect it to this day. I like it a lot. On occasion, once in a long while, I would watch a good boxing match. Uh, however, I also realized uh, already at an early age that it is a most injurious sport. Mm. And you seldom see anybody over 40, 45 training boxing because of that exactly. Now, the manner in which you might injure yourself varies. Um, people think it's mostly head injuries. Actually, people tend to more commonly injure their joints and tendons. Uh, what happens is this excessive work with um, uh, mid-level bags, heavy bags and such, that takes a strain. You know, the, the training method is injurious, actually. The sport, not as much if you don't do a lot of combat. So I figured, you know, after boot camp, because I, I got injured a little bit in boot camp, it was difficult. And, and I realized, okay, might want to do something that I could carry into old age, even though I was young. Um, Okinawan Karate was something uh, that piqued my interest. Actually, uh, slightly beforehand, I, I had a little tour with um, a Vietnamese branch of Wing Chun mm. under uh, Sifu Igor Zakashinsky, also a really nice guy who teaches here in Israel. He's been at it here in Israel for 20 years. He studied that um, rather rare lineage of Wing Chun in, uh, in Soviet Russia back in the day. Then mm. he uh, made Aliyah, as we say in Israel, he um, Aliyah is a Hebrew word for ascendance. That's how we call it when you when a Jew immigrates to Israel. So he came here, started teaching this Vietnamese Wing Chun. Very old school, uh, teaches at this like very um, movie, movie film, like uh, martial arts movie type of uh, guan, you know, in the basement, everything wooden, giant wooden dummy, funky looking wooden dummy also. It's, it's unlike the, the Hong Kong ones, which are, often sort of hung from the wall with these two bars, right? right. Two bars attached to, to other two bars. Um, and then the, the Vietnamese one, traditionally, is actually not attached to anything. It's just this massive thing weighing, I think, can weigh the upwards of 
think 200, 240 pounds, something like that. Wow. It's just a solid, giant, very thick, round log. And the idea is that you strike it and you slightly move it around with your strikes. So I, I guess in Vietnam, they had enough trees to cut down at, at this level of thickness. I mean, you really, it's very difficult to get trees this size for dummies nowadays. Right. Um, well, that, it was an interesting experience. I did that for three months. Um, then through a friend, I got into Okinawan karate. I've been interested in that. Start studying under uh, Itzy Cohen Sensei. Itzy Cohen Sensei, uh, who's a good friend of mine to this day, uh, a person whom today is not my teacher, but I consider a mentor. I was just speaking with him earlier today. A lovely person. He was um, already, I think, a fifth or sixth dan in uh, Shito Yu Karate. Later, later, he transitioned to Shorin Yu Karate. And he's also been at it for, I think, 30 years by the time I got in his dojo. And a lot of my attitude and approach towards traditional martial arts actually comes from him. From my rather brief period at his dojo, which was only um, one of years. And this was during the time when I was, um, you know, a policeman. So that was a very interesting time because I was studying at this Okinawan Karate. And I had to be really serious about my practice because, uh, you know, every day I essentially had an opportunity to or was coerced if need be, to use those skills in real life. Although uh, it was very seldom, in my case, that we got into real life threatening violence, it was mostly the verbal threats most of the time, because unlike in the United States, the uh, police scene, if you could call it that, here in Israel is not as nearly as violent. I mean, back in the day, I was serving between 2006, 2009, you're talking like in a the, the country back then was, I think, 9.2, 9.3 million people. Now we're nearing 10 million people. So imagine in a country of 9.3 million people, the murder rate in the entire country was just 400 people a year. Mm. It's basically nothing, like so mm. nothing. And half of these guys were just criminals killing each other. So for the ordinary citizen, actually, the, the real statistical rate was like 200 a year. So Israel is, is far less a violent place than one would be inclined to believe. Now, these 400 deaths do not include the terrorism and the wars we got here. That's something else. Talking mm -hmm. civilian life. Right. Okay, so, yeah, essentially, like, when, when you study a martial art and, and you're in the you know, policing business or in the, you're in the military and such, that shit gets real, you know? Right. You got to make sure things work. I have a, one funky example from, from those times. Uh, I was, there, there was a holiday, I think, in the police headquarters, so there's hardly anybody in the building. It's a very large building. There are a few thousand people working there. During that day, maybe you know, 50 people in the entire building. And I happened to be, and I went to the, like there was, a, there was an internal grocery store for the cops mm -hmm. to, to buy all sorts of unhealthy nonsense. So I went in and there's these two ladies running the shop who were screaming, screaming. You couldn't hear them. Like right out the door, you couldn't hear them at all. Because in Israel, we build things out of very thick concrete because it's an earthquake-prone region. As, as some people know, like the whole Jordan River, the Dead Sea, this whole region, this whole thing, it's like the Dead Sea is the lowest place on Earth, right? right. I think it's uh, minus 400 meters under sea level. That's because it's a giant freaking crack, you know, from uh, prehistorical earthquakes. Um, so anyway, the thing was built so well, you could actually hear this lady scream outside that, that grocery store. And I step in, and there's this enormous guy, must have been six foot five, six foot six, like rawr, going about like a King Kong in the place. Rawr, rawr, rawr. He's, he's acting real weird, real weird. Like he wasn't in his right mind, you know? You could see immediately like he was violent, but he wasn't actually, he didn't quite understand what he was doing. So that's a, that's a weird situation there because. If, if he was just, a, he wasn't attacking the ladies. He was just throwing stuff about, clashing into things. Wasn't drunk though. Right. It was also obvious he, it, it wasn't by, he didn't reach that state by alcohol. Now, I'm not quite certain what happened there. Was he, was he on drugs? Or the ladies were screaming nonsense. They're saying like, oh, like his blood sugar dropped. Uh, what the hell are you talking about? Blood sugar dropped. The guy's like a gorilla in your place, you know? So that stuff, blood sugar dropped. <laughs> anyway, so I had to think fast and, you know, what do you do with this guy? I didn't have any weapon on him, on me. I couldn't friend him with a weapon. 
So I jump the guy and I try to, I, I basically put him in an elbow lock, standing elbow lock with the little skill they had back there. Remember, I just had two years of boxing and maybe a year of Okinawan uh, Karate at the time, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it was very little experience, but so I was trying to restrain the guy. Unfortunately, like he didn't quite fight back. He was just trying to resist my, uh, my elbow lock. So I was trying to hold him there and I had to put the lock several times over. And then after I held him for about 10 minutes, eventually like the hysterical ladies got their senses and called somebody because we didn't have cell phones. It was all chaotic. And somebody came in and with handcuffs and took it. Wow. I, I still don't know what the hell that, was, that, that thing was about, but this was um, uh, my first, you know, real life application of real martial arts. You know, I, I had a lot of fights as a kid and as a teenager, but it was really like trying to, actually do real martial arts on a person in an interesting sort of way, like proves, you know, in everyday life, oftentimes in current, you encounter situations where in, I mean, what, what are you going to do? Like, I, I, I wouldn't punch the person, like that person, you could see internally, he was miserable, you know, right. he couldn't, well, what do you, what are you going to do? And in Israel, it's not like, like in the States, someone would see someone like that, just shoot them in the head. You know, no questions asked, the courts wouldn't mind. Israel, I, I would be put on trial for murder if I did that. Right. You know, even if he tried to resist arrest, so to speak. Also, I, by the way, I, 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 I had no idea, is this a cop? Is this civilian? I, I didn't know. No. I was in civilian clothing, you know. I was with, like, our unit was kind of like, sort of akin to what you call a CSI in the United States. Not quite, though. And so we were in civilian clothing. So there were all sorts of people walking in civilian clothing in the building. So you couldn't tell. Weird situation. In any case, to put to put things short, after there, um, after that, that period of time, with the police force, and after quitting the dojo, uh, not for bad reasons or anything. Like I said, the Isik Sensei and I are still good friends to this day. I got into Shingi Ichiren under uh, Shifuni Tan Oren, who is my teacher and friend to this day. is like family to me. Uh, I and I'll I'll just. Uh, say say things briefly and then if you have more questions about these styles and, and teachers and whatnot we can go from there so i spent um five years under Shifunitan, and then i found uh master sapir tal and uh Sip sapir is, is another wonderful person uh under whom i was for nearly five years and he taught me suffer mantis of the juklum lineage so we can get into that if you'd like and then um, eventually I, I sort of became a non-official student of um, Master Stephen Jakovitz. And Professor Jakovitz is a doctor of traditional Chinese medicine. And he primarily taught me traditional Chinese medicine, but also on occasion some martial arts. And I also traveled to him to see him in New York to write a book together on Chinese medicine. And then he taught me some more martial arts. And then um, lastly, uh, I became a a student of um, Master Brian Hall from Boston, who's a sort of a hidden dragon in the martial arts community. Uh, I, I should go back for a moment. Um, Chef Stephen taught me um, a rather old school type of Bagua Zhang, uh, Ching Ching Mountain Bagua, which is said to be a pre pre Dong Hai Tran style of Bagua Zhang. So we, we can get to what that means later and uh, the history of Bagua Zhang and whatnot. And, and, and later, my, my latest teacher, my fifth teacher, um, oh, I skipped one, so get back to this in a second. Um, my latest teacher, my, uh, Master Brian Hall, uh, he's teaching me also some very rare old school Shaolin from uh, Citizen Lee family, mm-hmm. uh, a family tradition of Shaolin that's not commonly seen. Now, the teacher I, I skipped, and sadly, unfortunately, um, is very beloved, uh, late master Zhou Jingxuan, who was my Shigong, Shigong my teacher's teacher, he's uh, Shifuni Tan's teacher. Uh, and, and I went and I studied under him for several months on and off in, in China, in the city of Tianjin. And also here in Israel, he came for, for a month and he, a part of that time he lived in my house and uh, we practiced and I, I studied under him every day. So that's briefly like my five teachers, my five main teachers uh, in Chinese martial arts. Um, that Shifu Nitsan Orn, Master Sapir Tal, Master Zhou Jing Chuen, Master Stephen Jakovitz, and Master Brian Hall. And then I also studied under Kutran Antal and Itsiko and Sensei. Had some amazing teachers. 
Yeah, but, they're, they're wonderful, wonderful people. Going back briefly to the encounter that you had at the police station, was that sort of like a, a turning point for you? Did, were you frustrated with uh, with um, the techniques that you try to use on the guy? And did that did that play any part in you deciding to seek out like a, a different martial art? Actually, at the time, I wasn't thinking about it that way. There's something about the Okinawan Karate, which is studied that, <clears throat> how shall we put it? I think, <clears throat> okay, so I, I, I actually had this, one could call spiritual turning point. Some might, you know, like, if, if people are religious, that was, they might even call it like a, a religious turning point, even though I'm a, a very spiritual person, I'm not a religious person, certainly not a Taoist, but here's the story. So I was thinking about the Okinawan Karate, which I was studying. By the way, Shitoryu Karate, which is what uh, Itsuk Sensei was into at the time, Shitoryu Karate is uh, often called the Japanese Karate, and usually it is, but Itsuk Sensei, having studied it in, in Okinawa and, and visited Okinawa numerous times, and he created a very uh, Okinawan sort of dojo. And then uh, um, a brother of him, of his in the system, um, Lothar Grusa Sensei, who's a friend of mine, Lothar Grusa Sensei also, at the bit, back in the day, I think it was six down now, probably seven, he uh, donated the entire dojo, cost him a fortune, probably like... Uh, Two hundred fifty, three hundred thousand dollars, something like that, to to build up the place to to look like a real, authentic Okinawan dojo, you know, and and so there's a very Okinawan dojo atmosphere, even though Shitoryu Karate was created by uh, Mabuni Kenwa Sensei, who was Japanese in his attitude. I think he was born in Okinawa. It's very Japanese. Um, nonetheless, the karate, the atmosphere, and everything was very Okinawa. So as I was studying this Okinawan stuff, I think to myself, like, is this the right place for me? You know, I think of this, if people have seen the, the, the Disney version, the animated Hercules film, and there's a song where he, he's singing about, you know, finding his place among the people. Is he among the people or among the gods? Like, what's the right place for him? I, I throughout my life, I identified with that song. But what's my place in the world? And, and I kept thinking to myself, is it not? Like with boxing, I felt very comfortable, but you know, I didn't want to do any sports martial arts anymore. The, the Vietnamese Wing Chun was a very brief experience, just three months. And then the Okinawan Karate, I like, I don't know. I don't know, am I like Okinawan leaning, Japanese leaning in terms of culture? I like anime. Uh, I, I think Jap Japanese language, the spoken Japanese language is rather catchy. It's much easier for me to learn. Like when when I was a teen, I was watching a lot of anime. I could speak fluent sentences in Japanese. It was very easy compared with Chinese. Chinese is a very difficult language. Right. And but then there was a point, the turning point I was talking about. So I was I, I was driving to this furniture store to to get something for my mom, which she ordered. And as I was waiting in the furniture store for the uh, customer service people to, to approach me, they're busy. I was looking around and on the top of a closet, the wooden closet, there was a wooden statue about this size, right? About this size of Guang Gong, mm. Guang Yu. Mm. He, and he was standing there, you know, it's halberd, very official. I, I have a little, uh, it's not around here in this room, but I have a little statue of uh, Guang Gong at home. And there's a, He's the patron god of both martial arts and businesses. So right. if you're a martial arts teacher, that's a good combination. Right. Um, and so and for, for those uh, among the listeners who don't know, um, so Guan Yu is a historical figure who is has a mythical status in Chinese culture because uh, Guan Yu is, has been immortalized in, um, in a very famous book called The Romance of the Three Kingdoms. He's one of the heroes of this book and is a very, very violent, but also a very virtuous person, a chivalrous person. And it is he's considered a god in, in the Taoist lore because he was so saintly and sagely in his behavior that eventually somehow he was deified. As a matter of fact, I, despite having researched Chinese culture for so many years, I'm not quite sure. And I, I do have to ask uh, my teacher, uh, Shifu Stephen Jakovitz, was a Taoist priest. How is it that the person actually gets deified? Like, what's the process? They have to die, and then they they become this god. Or is it during my life? Like, 
there, there is some theology there, you know? I'm not quite sure what it is. Is it Jesus-like or do they have like a different process? What do you do? Like, yeah, you sign up for it. Like so, someone like there's a group of people surrounding you and then like they spiritualize you into another plane. Like what's going on there? Not quite sure. Not quite sure. So I was seeing this Kwang Kwang. It's always like, look at this. Look at that. Look at you. And he was there like this, this big statue, you know, on the, on the wooden closet looking down at me. And I was looking at him. And I was thinking, that was the moment I was thinking, is this it? Is this me? Like, can I, can I have a conversation with that culture? Hmm. hmm. I wasn't quite sure, you know? And it's interesting because um, in, for the, the American or Canadian crowds uh, watching this, listening to this, Chinese culture, of course, they've, they've seen some Chinese culture. Uh, not not as much in, in Israel. You see, in Israel, uh, up until the the early two thousands, uh, I've I've actually literally barely saw any Chinese people in my life. They don't have Chinese communities here. There are no Chinatowns. Okay, there may be like I think up until the early two thousands, probably like four or five Chinese restaurants in the entire country. For mm -hmm. us, right? And and where's the famous? connection between the Jews and, and Chinese food, you know? Yeah, that only happens in, in America. Uh, it started happening here in Israel also in the past decade or so, but wasn't here historically. So there are no Chinese around, no Chinese culture, very few people yeah, teaching traditional Chinese martial arts. Um, and Chinese films, you know, the, Kung Fu, the famous Kung Fu films from Hong Kong and such, very few people were watching such things. Except for the Bruce Lee movies, you know, people had very little exposure to Chinese culture. And Japanese culture was already big here. There were a lot of um, Israelis who traveled to, to Japan to study there. And sometimes spent you know, upwards of a decade or more studying in Japan, studying martial arts and other topics. But um, the, the Japanese culture, nah, not as much, not as much. You know, very few people. And so I wasn't quite sure, you know, what, what is this Chinese culture? What does it stand for? Had no idea, had no idea. But you know that was just a long time ago, um, and eventually I ended up, you know, very politely um, excusing myself out of the dojo in a, a nice conversation with um, Itzik Sensei. I think it's very important, you know, if you're a martial arts student and you're going to part ways with your teacher, you have to do this as politely as possible with courtesy. Um, and, and keep in touch, you know, if, if you were with your teacher for a while and you respect them, that they don't teach you martial arts anymore doesn't mean that they cannot continue to teach you something, you know. As I said, I still consider Itzik Sensei a mentor, so it's very good. I think he's, he's, a, he's a wonderful person. That I, have, that I have stopped studying, you know, martial arts from him doesn't mean that I stopped studying other things from him. I think that's a great attitude to have. That's wonderful advice for people watching too, because it's something that happens, but people often don't end it well. Yeah, um, unfortunately. So, any case, um, uh, I got looking for Chinese martial arts, and uh, I, I probably visited six or seven schools, and I, I had this connection with uh, my teacher Shifuni Tan. He's he's just a lovely character, and um, we we sort of connected on an intellectual level, the way we think. We, we, we ended up both being, later on, we ended up both being authors and we we were scholars and researchers and, and we like to dig deep into things. I saw that he really knew what he was talking about. He could explain things and he was willing to explain things in ways that other teachers would not. The, the technicalities of how you do stuff. And, and so even though the, the practice was initially very boring, um, I kept with it. And I got to say, without... His teaching and influence, I wouldn't have been where I am today. And I probably skipped it, but you know what I touched, studied under uh, Shifunitan was um, Xing Yi Chuan. Okay, so the martial arts that which I studied and or still studying or practicing are Xing Yi Chuan, Pi Gua Zhang, um, Nan Tang Lan Pai, that's in Mandarin, the Southern Praying Mantis system or sect, uh, Ba Gua Zhang, and Li family Shaolin. Now, of course, there's a lot of Li family, a lot of stuff called Li family Shaolin. For, right. Fortunately, the Chinese 
uh, do not have or like, they typically use just over 100 common surnames. So it gets very confusing. There are a lot of Lee people doing Shaolin and there's a lot of Shaolin going about. It's difficult to distinguish, but you can talk about that system a little bit more. Nonetheless, despite having studied and practice or still practicing um, these arts, the way I teach is not using these names and these styles exactly, but rather uh, I teach something called Tongbuda, uh, the way of synchronicity. So that's a name of my own making. And synchronicity is a term that comes to us from uh, the uh, Swiss famous scholar and sage of the 20th century, Carl Jung, yep. and it's actually a term that he created, synchronicity. Uh, it's the opposite of the butterfly effect. Um, the butterfly effect says that, you know, one thing pushes another and then things happen. Synchronicity is the idea which they would call um, like a, a quantum uh, entanglement, that things are interwoven like all the droplets in the ocean. And so and one thing moves, all the other things move, and essentially all things are connected. So how do you create that sort of synchronicity in your movement, in your mind, in your relationships with other people? That's the overarching themes it's an ultra overarching theme in the martial art that I teach throughout that curriculum. And so that is why I chose that name. But essentially, there's a curriculum made out of all the martial arts that I study, that I practice, just um, ordered and structured in a slightly different way than what, what and how my teachers taught me. Hopefully improving the, not the martial arts themselves as much, because I haven't added a lot, but rather the structure of the 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 contents the order in which they're taught and how they're taught and we can get to that later so that, that's something that not a lot of people do i think a lot of people are just too humble so they they think like oh i can't invent a new martial art that's like out of line or they think like yeah only if i was the greatest warrior alive could i create a new martial art or like and then people tend to forget you know all these martial arts that i counted you know none of them has a history going back over 250 years and some of them, like Xing Yichun, Bagua Zhang, Xing Yichun has historical origins going back to 150 years, but Xing Yichun itself, the, the current iteration is only about 150 years old. Right. And so people came, came about just like I did and said, you know, here, here's a new curriculum. Here's my understanding of it. Let's do it. And you know what? I'm not quite sure these people were, maybe they're more skilled than I am, most probably, but they may not have been as smart or scholarly because uh, a lot of these people were just uh, illiterate and, mm -hmm. or could hardly read. And they knew very little about the world in general and about the human body relative to what a lot of martial arts teachers know today. Simply because they, it's not they were, that they weren't smart, they were. It's, just, it's that they did not have access to education like we, we have. I mean, think about it, you know. Not only have we gone through 12 years of state sanctioned education, which is overall shit, but it still, it still amounts to a lot of worldly information, you know, that the average Chinese person had no clue about back in the day. But on top of that, I got my education, you know, with the, the Israeli military, the IDF, Israeli Defense Forces, and then the police force, and then my experience there as a policeman. And then I had I, I got degrees in law and in government studies. And they and I wrote nine books and I and I uh, I'm studying and, and practicing traditional Chinese medicine. Like I mean come on. Right. Like not a lot there were there there are always also in this day people who have said way and, and have done way more than that in China. Okay. Like there 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 are people who, who are deep into traditional Chinese medicine are insanely scholastic like the, the the amount and level of knowledge that some of these people possess i could never hope to achieve I'm, I'm i'm talking honestly like people have memorized dozens of books on medicine like very complicated books and they if they see it like some of these people you know see a ridiculous amount of patients a day which is not might not be the best way to treat people but if you see 100 patients a day then you get that type of experience that like, you know nobody else could get it's, it's impossible it's like having like it's like it's the equivalent of having 100 fights a day which you couldn't do but you can do in medicine and so that's an insane amount of experience like an incredible amount of understanding of the human condition that that i, I may never reach 
in terms of experience. Maybe scholastically, I might reach a level of wisdom, life wisdom, that somehow gets a little bit close. But in terms of experience, I'd never get that because I'm not working at the hospital in China and I'm not, I've not been um, trained as a doctor or professor of Chinese medicine. I'm not at that level. But how many people in traditional Chinese martial arts have gone to that extent? You know, almost none. Right. We, we, we hear about the, like, the famous ones, like Xie Peiqi of uh, Yin Shi Bagua Zhang, Yin style, right? Yin style Bagua Zhang. But you know, how many people like that are there? Very few. Look at the Chen village people, as impressive as some of them, them are, and they're not educated. Hmm. So, so, like, so, so that's, by, by the way, there's a good, I think, who said this to me? One of my colleagues says this often. He says, uh, no, it's actually, yeah, that's uh, Shifu Stephen. So Professor Jack, Stephen Jack, who's not my teacher, he says um, about his main teacher, Master John, his Taoist priest, brilliant, brilliant man. As a, as a as Darius priest spiritually, he is so far and deep out there, you know, and he knows so much about medicine. It's amazing, but he says like that's not the guy you're gonna ask about politics. He's not gonna give you political. Advice. He doesn't know which car to buy. Like he doesn't know those things. He yeah. knows a whole lot about certain things, way more than most people alive, past or present, would ever know. But. You know, generally speaking, on most other topics is not that well educated. You know, and and a lot of people in the West they see this, they, they, they see people and their eyes look like that, and suddenly they experience reverse racism. Reverse racism is when they say, "Well, they're Asian." They, they say in their minds and their subconscious, "Oh, they're Asian. There must be geniuses, everybody, because they're Asian." So let's ask them about you know, sh should I dump my girlfriend? Should I invest in this and that in the stock market? They don't know about that. They don't know about that. But the thing is, oftentimes, as Shifu Stephen says, they sort of feel uncomfortable to not give an answer. They want to please. They want to be nice. So they just say something. But right. that doesn't mean they know anything about it. Anyway, where were we? I mean, we were talking about something. So how we got to the Chinese people giving advice on the stock market. So you were talking about um, how you were using your uh, educational background and, and all of the things that you know to to formulate this new system of teaching. And what one of the things I wanted to ask you about that is that you you have several arts that you teach and you you don't teach them all at the same time, right? You teach yeah. them in like a systematic progression. Is that right? Sort of, yes. Um, well, let's talk about this. Brings us to um, what, what one would call curriculum structuring. Okay. I mean. This is so foreign to the way that people in the West think about martial arts that we don't even have a term. Like I made up the term curriculum structuring. Who the hell is talking about this, right? Have you ever heard such a term? No, no people don't talk about it because the, the field of uh, pedagogy, by the way, like pedagogy in Greek was the two, like the, the art of teaching children. But then in English, it eventually became like the, uh, the art of teaching, you know, broadly speaking. So... Um, pedagogy is not something that most martial artists are being taught. Now, I do have a lot of experience with pedagogy because I've been teaching people since I was 14. And, and I actually, so I taught, I taught um, you know, programming languages, some computer skills to kids, teenagers, adults. And then I got teaching martial arts. I taught Hebrew, I taught English, I taught all sorts of things. So I gave private classes and all sorts of topics. So I do have a whole lot of experience teaching. I'm, I'm 35 years old now, meaning I've been teaching on and off for 21 years. Um, and the thing is, pedagogy is not all too great with traditional Chinese martial arts, most of them. They're just badly structured. The teachers were assuming that the person coming in is completely fluent in cultural nuances, of what's going on, what has been going on in China for thousands of years, that they received the traditional Chinese education. Well, that's not the case. I mean, uh, a lot of people have not received that education, you know, even in past times, like go 100 years ago, not everybody has gotten that education. And then, you know, with the communists coming in, the, the nature of uh, traditional Chinese education changed. And so all these cultural terms suddenly, they don't make as much sense, all these references. 
Chinese is a very elitist culture and an elitist language. It assumes that, you know, if you want in, you want into the inner circle, you got to do your your studies. You know, you got to study these classical books. Here's a pile of them, you know, here's a hundred of them, dig deep. And that's and, and they give you like, go to this guy, this this book and this book and that book and this, that, this book. And, you know, I, I have studied um, at least the, the fundamentals of some of them. Like the the Lunio, the the Analects of Confucius, and Dashwe, which is very it's like people call it the book. It's like three pages that Confucius wrote. The the Lunio, the Analects of Confucius, were written by his students and the uh, student descendants. Um, and then you know the Tao Te Ching and Zhuangzi, which are important Taoist works, and the uh, the I Ching, the Book of Changes, and such and things like of that nature. These are books that you know anybody who wants to to really understand traditional Chinese culture has to read those books and reading those books ain't easy because you can't just open the book and read it rather you have to to have two anywhere between two and four translations i'd recommend four and more open at the same time to just go sentence by sentence and compare the translations and trying to figure out what the hell was meant there because traditional chinese much like um hebrew is to this day but especially biblical hebrew can carry a lot of meanings it's something that people, English-speaking people, often don't know that uh, in the Hebrew Bible, every sentence has anywhere between two and ten different meanings. And for a Hebrew speaker, they're even in elementary school and high school, most of these meanings or all of them are taught. In English, you can't do that because you have to select just one translation, which would fit your understanding, you know, how it, how it ought to have been said in English. So you lose the uh, multifaceted meaning of it all. Same with Chinese. And so um, we have a problem with traditional Chinese martial arts. They're not well structured. Um, it ha also has to do with this sentence uh, uttered by Confucius in the Analects of Confucius, which is where the problem starts in part, here, where he says, he's actually correct in that. Um, in, in, a, in a perfect world, in a utopia, he would be correct. He says, that the oh, you have me there ah, i lost your phone one. okay you hear me yeah i can hear you you just froze for a second there yeah oh, okay excellent so Kongzi, Kongzi, which is confucius he said that a student a student ought to get one quarter of something of anything from the teacher and be able to come back to the teacher with the other three quarters mm. so what the Chinese understood from that over the centuries is that give them very little. They did intentionally give them very little and yeah. have them try to come back with the rest. And which is partly why traditional Chinese teachers don't tell you that much. But that's a shitty attitude. That's a bad, bad attitude. Now, sometimes, sometimes that's the right thing to do. Sometimes you can't just do it all the time. Because you're expecting people to understand your point of view. It doesn't work like that. Kongzi was talking about this in the context of here's a pile pile of books. We're all studying these books. So I, I give you a hint. I give you a quarter about something from these books. You go fetch from these books the other three quarters. All right. Because you know where to go fetch. But that's not the situation we're in. A Chinese or any Asian teacher comes to a Western country and you're totally out of your cultural context and you don't have access to the Chinese literature about martial arts and he gives you one quarter and you're just left with one quarter because right. you can't come back with the other three quarters. So that's a shitty attitude. So I have done quite a lot. I work tirelessly every day, hours and hours every day on average trying to put down in writing basically everything eventually i put on writing everything i know about martial arts it might take me a few decades to do this in order that people would have somewhere to go fetch from because otherwise i'm deceiving myself and them simultaneously now also why just give them a quarter and have them fetch three quarters why not give them a hole and ask them to bring the other hole because you see, this this all is spiritually speaking, okay? 
this what what Kongzi was saying, and I, and I like Confucius. You know, don't get me wrong; I'm more of, of a Confucian than I am um, a Taoist, and certainly not a Buddhist. But this is a scarcity mindset. Give him a quarter. Are oh, you so cheap, you bastard? Give him everything and have him come back with more. Right. Don't be cheap. Now, I think part of it is like the psychological game being played here is the teacher doesn't want the student to, to take the teacher for granted, right? right. You don't want to give them too much so they disrespect you. Okay. So you ought to do this with the right language, with the right attitude, for the right person at the right time. Don't give them everything immediately. Don't give them if they if they haven't proven themselves. But more so than, than not, the, the common problem we have is that people hold back. Now, which brings us to curriculum structuring. So how do we structure a curriculum that, first of all, prevents that problem? Second of all, makes, a, makes sense. So... Uh, I'll talk about two aspects of curriculum instruction. Uh, one is um, how you build a house. Talk about how you build a house. Secondly, um, metaphorically speaking, how you build a house. Secondly, um, single movements versus, versus forms. So these are two themes which I discuss in uh, my book, uh, The Martial Arts Teacher. And by the way, if you would like to get that book, it's currently temporarily off Amazon because I've had a, a, some problem with my account. Uh, but it's going to come back in the, in the coming months. So go for the Martial Arts Teacher 2, Martial Arts Teacher 2, which is the second edition. It's double the length. It's 540 pages. Oh, wow. So uh, much improved from the, the first edition. Curriculum structuring. So we, we're going to talk about building a house and single movements versus forms. So building a house. How do you build a house? You know, if you have some bricks, metaphorically speaking, you can... I have one pile of bricks. You put a brick on a brick on a brick on a brick, and then you go next to it and put a brick on a brick on a brick on a brick, and then you put next to it and you go brick on brick on brick on brick. Oh, or what you can do is, if the house is in the shape of a circle, so you make a circle of bricks, and then you make another circle of bricks on top of it, and you go back to the point of origin, and you start again, and again, and again. Every time you go back to the beginning of the circle and put another circle, another circle of bricks. So that's there's one, one way is to put the bricks on top of one the other, you know, in a very orderly way and then move to the other thing. The other way is to move between topics and then come back to the point of origin, then go back and back and forth, back and forth, back and forth in circles. Um, actually, you should use both methods. So I know teachers, for instance, who go to, to their, their class, like it's very common in Israel, People are affected by the, the military mindset of doing things. So, for instance, um, they would have a, what's called a lesson plan, mm -hmm. which personally, even though I respect, personally respect a lot of the teachers who do this as people, as teachers, as martial artists, I think this method is bullshit. And the reason is you make plans, God laughs. You come to class, you think you have a plan, right? Okay, right. so one student didn't get, didn't arrive. Our guy is sick. The third gal is sad today. This guy has an injury, and in the midst of all that craziness, oh, and 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 there's another guy who just had to fight with this other dude. In the midst of this, you had a plan. You're gonna teach them all the same technique. Right. You're a fool. Right. It's not gonna work long term. Like this is not going to work. And the problem is. And people come and they think like, oh, I have a lesson plan for this class. I have, a, I have a plan for this month, for this upcoming three months, and a plan for the entire year. And then make it, maybe we make a circle, okay, or, or maybe we move ahead. The thing is, if you course your plan on the actual life circumstances of what's going to happen in every class, so what's going to happen is you're going to teach that, but it's not going to be effective. And this is what happens, you know, when you when you're trying to like pile the bricks one one after you know, like pile them up on top of each other, and then you put another pile right next to that. That's like the lesson plan. But sometimes you gotta do that. I mean, sometimes it can work. Um, though nowadays I very seldom come to a class with a lesson plan. Rather, what I do is I look at the class, I get the the vibe that people have on that day, and I adjust, you know, what we want to do with the curriculum on that day. 
There's some elements that would repeat themselves. I would usually have a warm up, which I created. I would usually um, have them go through one or several of the jib and gong of the basic root exercises. Okay, but I would choose and change them, you know, with accordance to what's going on. And the, and the warm up would not always look the same. Might be more intense, less intense, shorter, longer, based on the on the day, on the energetic vibe amongst the students, on the season. Seasons are important, especially when you uh, take the students to practice outside. And well, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and and so that's when you lay bricks one next to the other. And and when you go in circles, now that can be better. But the problem is you skip between topics, and so there isn't enough, there isn't sufficient consistency. So what happens is you teach something. Now in a perfect world, if you had uh, perfect students, they would study something for two or three weeks, then you move on to the next topic. And the thing that they've just studied for two or three weeks, they're gonna keep practicing at home. You'd hope for it. That's what I will do when I was taught by my teachers. Most people don't do that. And so if you only get back to that topic a year later, you will discover that nobody remembers anything or they remember very little. And so that's ineffective in that way. So it's in, in terms of um, curriculum structuring, you know, how you build a house um, has to be a little bit of both. On one hand, you have to be consistent and, and have some broad plan as to where you, you want to get each of them. And there's no easy way to go about it. You really can't, if you want to be a professional teacher of traditional martial arts, not sports related martial arts, then you would have, you would have to cater to the need, specific needs and progress of every individual student. And, and you'd have to memorize some of it. You really have to remember where they're at or uh, make some, um, Create some methods for yourself to to say things to them which would remind you of where they're at. Because otherwise, you're trying to teach a group and you can never teach a group really. You're to, you're, you're, you can say you're teaching a group, but essentially you're always teaching individuals. Mm. Everybody are very different. It's very seldom that there are students, two students which are quite similar in terms of body structure, the, the level of skill, their progress, and their knowledge within a style. You know, that doesn't happen often. And so, nonetheless, it's very interesting. Despite this being the case, I am not of the opinion that you should segment the classes to beginners and advanced. I think advanced students, really advanced students, could be taught in very small groups or private classes that could and should be had. But a skilled teacher ought to be able to teach like a first class student and a 15 year veteran the same class and have them both come out of the class feeling they've learned something and being satisfied with what they learned that day. So how do you do that? How do you take the same movement, the same skill, the same combination, the same technique, the same form, and you convey totally different levels of meaning? Well, that's a very subtle. That's like asking the Italians, how do they make their simple food so delicious while other people cannot that takes experience takes skill not all of actually i i was saying that you know i'm trying to put down in writing everything i know but that's actually impossible a lot of it is is an art it's the feel of it all so you, you can't really 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 put it down in writing not everything not everything so that's one aspect which we were talking about like building house the other aspect is um single movements versus forms. So what I noticed, uh, my, my first solid style, traditional Chinese style was, um, and had, it still is in a way, in many ways, uh, Xing Yi Chuan. Let's say um, the, the bulk of Tong Bu Dao is Xing Yi Chuan. Even though Xing Yi Chuan is not such a broad style in terms of the, uh, the amount of stuff that's in its original curriculum in most languages, um, as compared with with other styles, right? I'd say the the size of the curriculum is like small to medium. It's rather modest, in my opinion. I, th I think that Wing Chun, a full curriculum of of traditional Wing Chun, whichever the lineage has more in it, generally like more in terms of stuff, right? Than 
uh, most lineages of traditional Sinichuan. and not all of them, but most of them. So Sinichuan focuses on the practice of single movements. There are rel relatively few forms. I don't like the, the some lineages that were created like they didn't have anywhere between like 12, 20 forms. And I find it ridiculous. That's not the essence of that particular art. And it's just movements put together with no, there's no special connection there. It's just movement for the sake of movement. And so, it, and, and the, the forms are not impressive by any means or standards. It's just, it's a waste of time. Most, not all, most of them. And the, and Sing Yichuan is made out of, um, essentially, uh, Zhang Zhuang, which is a type of standing practice with various um, iterations to it. And some Jibin Gong, some basic root skills, some basic exercises, some uh, various partner exercises, maybe uh, anywhere between one to three short partner forms, very short. Uh, and then they'd have um, five basic movements uh, called the five, five, some people call them five elements, and more accurately, ought to be called probably five phases. Um, and then these. On top of these five basic movements, there are the 12 animals. The 12 animals are based off these five basic movements. The animals might be, uh, every animal might have a few hand combinations, or some of them have short forms, short movement forms, in Chinese Taolu, in Japanese called Kata. And then to have several weapons, depending on the lineage, our lineage only had like two, four, two uh, medium length forms for spear. Some lineages also have uh, a straight sword, broadsword, which are, which are the Jian and Tao, and there's uh, the spear is called Tiang. Um, some lineages have staff and sometimes even other weapons, but generally speaking, Xing Yichun resonates most with um, with the spear as a weapon. And and not a whole lot more than you know what I was just listing verbally. Um, and so most of these things, however, are practiced as single movements and they, they the general idea in that style is that single movement practice is what gives you the most profound skill in that style, which is probably true. Then you have uh, styles such as Taiji Chuan. And Taiji Chuan, uh, all lineages are famous for their very long Taolu, very long movement forms. And that's a totally, you could say even almost the opposite type of practice. Even though also in Taiji Chuan, it's also said amongst many of the traditional teachers that the uh, one of the keys to skill is to take all of these movements and have them as a single movement practice. You know, that's key there. So that commonly happens. And then you have Bagua Zhang, which sort of have, it has both because the, the, in, in Bagua Zhang, you practice uh, quite a bit. And in most lineages, that's the bulk of the practice. You walk, practice walking in a circle. And transitioning between movements while walking in the circles. It's an ancient Taoist practice which has been adapted to, uh, to fit martial arts. It's a very novel and interesting idea. And in Pagodan, you can transition between single movements all the time, or you can flow between many movements and sort of make it into a Tao. So you got a little bit of both. So in my system, in Tonguda, what you do is you start with single movements. And you have about, uh, you, you have, we, we have a warm up, for, uh, not a warm, but the Jib and Gong form. After the warm up itself, the warm up is, it has martial movements in it, but it's a warm up. Properly, it's, it's just a warm up. Then and it's, it's based on um, foundational skills, but it's still a warm up. Then we have uh, the, what's called the Tie Shou Si Qiao, Tie Shou Si Qiao, Iron Arm Silk Bridges, which is uh, a movement form that I, I studied under Master Brian Hall. And then improve myself. It's kind of similar um, to the Wing Chun Silim Tao, in it's, which is a very famous Tao Lu. In my opinion, more sophisticated. Some people would think otherwise. That's fine. And it basically what it does, it covers all the hand formations and bridges that we use with the palms, fists, and arms in all of the martial arts contents that we study later. So that, that movement form, which is done standing with initially with feet parallel and then more advanced way to do it is with uh, both feet for, porting, pointing uh, 45 degree inward, which in some lineages, in some Chinese martial arts called Babu, uh, it's uh, eight step because it, it, it is similar to the Chinese character for eight, the number eight. And 
in Wing Chun is often called the goat holding step because it's like holding a goat, trying to hold it to not move between uh, both your legs. Yeah. So that stance can be quite difficult when done correctly and done low with both uh, both knees touching one another and the back fully erect, et cetera, et cetera. So it's done that way in the more advanced way. And then you move between the different bridges. As you move go one, two, three, four, things, stuff like that. Um, and you do all, you basically cover most of the angles that you might use with your forearms and your open palms and your fists. Most of them, not all of them. And then after that, we have the Ji Ben Gong, which is um, the, the Tia Shan Zetia is a simple um, form to learn. So I've timed it. Uh, I actually took my students on a, when I, when I got, when I brought this into the system a few months ago, um, because it's, it's a very good foundational stuff, really brilliant. Um, and I was very, I'm very thankful for Shifu Brian for having taught that to me. Um, when I brought in the system a few months ago, I, I, I did this free seminar for my students. I think it took me a total of um, about 10 hours, with a, like over several days and with a lot of breaks, 10 hours to teach them the whole thing. So that's not that difficult, 10 hours. I mean, the martial, in the context of martial arts, that's not a lot. Uh, to teach them that to, to a decent level where they remember all the movements and they are pretty accurate in, in how they move. So after that, we have the Jibben Gong. The Jibben Gong cover a basic fist on palm strikes and also um, three types of kicks. Then we have the Shirley, which are traditional exercises, which I expanded a, a bit on uh, from Xing Yi Chuen and Yi Chuen. You find them also in the Dancing Chuen, also called Yi Chuen. This sister art created from Xing Yi Chuen, um, which are the, the Shirley are basically um, vectors for movement, the generalized vectors for movement that you'd use in their striking or grappling. So, for instance, this type of circle, right? This type of circle, or this type of circle. Or this type of circle, right? Or this type of opening, going back and forth. And some of them I had to take from several martial arts in order to cover all the circles in all angles. So the Shirley actually covers, this is the idea, you cover all the types of circles you might do with the body in all angles. So it's interesting how, for instance, um, this one was extant in Shingi Chuen, but actually was not practiced in most lineages as um, as a standalone skill it was present in the part in partner dress. But you see this in, in Yang, yeah, Yang style. You see this type of thing, right? <clears throat> yeah, like this type of movement. And and then its opposite, which is this coming in and opening. This type of thing. You see it in South Amantis, but you didn't see it in Sing Yichuan. And I doubt this exists in, maybe you see it, I think it's in Bagua but you don't see it in Tai Chi So nothing like going in here, this deep, and then opening up like this. This is very Mantis like right. type of thing. Um, but it covers a very specific type of power vector and, and circles, right? This type this type of circle, which may be extant in Tai Chi Chuan like, like so, right? But not with the type of movement that I showed earlier. So essentially the Jib and Gong covers all the basic striking methods and the Shirley, all the basic uh, circles that one would use in grappling or striking. Then after someone has studied all that, all the things that I just mentioned, as well as um, maybe 10, I think, no, it's five partner drills, Six, six partner drills and one short um, um, joint locking form, China. So I'm, um, as everything I said just until now, and then there's six partner drills, which are rather easy to learn. It's also cover like circles and types of um, uh, circle and spiral scenarios that you commonly have with opponents. And then there is a short, uh, I think 13 or 14 movement joint lock form in which basically you go back and forth, you, you apply one joint lock, the other guy gets out of the joint lock and then applies the, the counter joint lock on you. 
they study that and then they show them how to apply that those these standing flows between joint locks on the ground also because we do have ground grappling in Tongbudao, which is not extant in most traditional Chinese martial arts. After the whole that, and maybe a few things in between, maybe depending on the student, they might put in like maybe a few power drills from Suffer Mantis or some other things. Then they transition into a very long form called Honyuan Chuan. Now Honyuan is um, the name of this type of Zhang Zhuang that people often call Zhang Bao Zhang. Zhang Bao Zhang is um, um, Chang, not Zhang Bao, sorry, Cheng, Cheng Bao, Cheng Bao, uh, Cheng Bao uh, Zhang, which is uh, hugging the tree posture. They, they sit like this. You see all the people. I'm I'm sorry for the offense, all of you folks from Chen village lineages, and you stand like that, like you zombies or hamsters. You know, people, come on. Uh, have you ever seen anybody in fighting standing like this? No, you stand like this, right? Oh. So you're, you're going to have to open your fingers a little bit, create a little bit of intention, open up your tendons, right? Because if you're like that, your tendons are not activated. Right. We always talk about, like in the in all the classics, the internal arts, you talk about sucking the laogong, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, sucking the laogong. Right. How are you going to do that if your hands are like this, like a hamster? Yeah. And come on, people, think, think, think. Like that meme from Invincible. <laughs> if you know what I'm talking about, some of you do know. Uh, fake Mark, fake. Anyway, uh, no, so we don't stand like this. We stand like that. And there are um, different types of Zhang which are so-called static postures. It's not really static. There's a lot of internal dynamics going on. It's a very broad topic we can get into later. Right. So then after people have been focused for and could be anywhere between two years to four years. I'd say the first two to four years, depending on student progress. You know, did they come with previous experience? How how fast can they learn? You know, and so we get into a, a very long form called Honyuan Chuan. Honyuan is the name of this. Like instead of calling this Changbao Chuan, the tree 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 hugging, like they hug the tree like this, like the tree had um, boobs, and you hug that the boobs like that. No, no. It's not like that, and it's at the, the height of the tip of the nose. It is called Honyuan. Now, Honyuan is, um, it's it's both things. Depending on the pronunciation in Chinese, can be uh, one is slippery roundness, slippery roundness, which is the feel that this thing has on the inside, slippery roundness. And the other thing, which is Honyuan, is also the name of the. But in Hebrew, actually, a direct equivalent to what in the in the Bible, I don't. I think in the, in the English Bible, they probably translated it into chaos in the Book of Genesis. But in Hebrew, it's called tovavo. Tovavo is is essentially honyan. It's the primordial state before the that like the yin and yang were just like ah, floating about. They weren't yet like this. The yin and yang were yet to be like this. They're just scattered and mishmashed all over. Like oil floating in water without actually being, you know, within the soup hasn't infused into the soup. It's just floating about. It's chaos. So, yeah. In any case, um, Honyuan Chuan is the name I have given the form where, uh, with which I essentially offer the entire curriculum on a plate. It's a very long form. It takes about 20, at about, I would say, what what I call walking speed, which is like fast walk in the park. If you perform the entire form that the entire tailu that way, it would take you 20 minutes to complete. Wow. And so you don't um, use explosive power five gene throughout most of the form. You can use it wherever you want because you can use it for with nearly every movement. But to practice five gene like short distance explosive power, you usually do it with um, a few combinations put together or parts of the form or single movements. We do the whole form, actually the emphasis on being smooth and slow. Uh, you can do it very slowly. You can make it last up to like an hour and a half if you'd like. It, it's extremely difficult. And so uh, that's a very long form. It's equivalent of the Taiji long forms and has essentially most of what I practice and teach is in that form in terms of movement and concepts and internal methods. And then afterwards, 
Then comes the Bhagwan, the other stuff, which then breaks apart the concept of the long form back to single movement. So you go from the beginning of the of the art, your the, which is by the way, that's the, the the progression that I've had as a person, but I think is is very good for anybody to have. You go from single movements to a long form practice, which I also do it in circle walking. When I do circle walking, can be like a long form practice because I could do a circle walking for say an hour straight. And non if you do it nonstop, that's like doing a very long form. That's the equivalent, uh, especially if you go through through and in between many movements. And so single movements, long form, and then single movements again, which can be combined spontaneously into long forms. So that follows, um, and, and, and I should apologize for not remembering the Chinese term, but in uh, Japanese, it's called shohari. Are you familiar with that term, shohari? Not sure. Shohai is the, is the idea of the development of Gong Fu. Uh, that, like the same Buddhism, um, how they say it, in the beginning, rivers are not rivers. Oh, yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, to say, in the, in the beginning, uh, rivers are rivers and mountains are mountains. Then rivers are no longer rivers, mountains are no, no longer mountains. In the end, Rivers are rivers and mountains and mountains. Right. Now, what's meant by that is meant that when we're very young, we take things for granted. So we look at the rivers and the mountains, and it's just what they are. But we don't really understand them. Then we grow up, and we learn about soil science, and we learn about we learn about physics, about geology, and about the flow of water, and the birds, and the animals, and the snow, and everything that's in the rivers and mountains. And like, wow, the rivers and the mountains are such complex, crazy systems. And they grow older and time passes. And eventually we look at the rivers and mountains and it's like, eh, you know, yeah. these are just rivers and mountains. And we could see the nuance and complexity without having to think about all that nuance and complexity. So right. that's how, exactly how the curriculum structure is in Tongbuda. Initially, you know, I think it's just simple when it's a single movement. And then they become crazy nuanced and then the, this long tail doing Hui and Tren. And then they once more return to the idea of you know being simple simple and ziran ziran is an important Taoist concept which is which i apply in my martial arts ziran is naturalness right. i actually explored it like hardcore i i, I walk barefoot 95 percent of the time on the street everywhere and unless i went to like a like a wedding or a mitzvah or something right. i walked everywhere barefoot for three years including the winter time just covered myself better um, isn't I mean I wouldn't recommend it. It's not that great for your kidneys. You absorb a lot of cold for the feet. Yeah. Uh, but I did that to explore the naturalness, like what's the natural condition of the human being. Did all sorts of experiments like that. So now that I again, it's not something I teach, and I wouldn't recommend, but it was interesting. So naturalness, and also at the level after the Hunyan train, after the long form, which by the way is not on video. I've never shown it to anybody outside of her school. I'll show it to any any visitor if they want, but I just don't like it on film. I feel that you know some people call me a master, I'm not a master. Maybe in 30 years. I'm not good enough to show it to the general public yet. But I'm decent. And after the Hunian train, uh, when you get to the Bagua stuff and other stuff, um, we start talking about the, the trigrams and what do they mean. And basically, uh, the trigrams describe, if we apply them to martial arts, not, not everybody does it, not even in Bhagwajan. The trigrams describe the, they come from the Book of Changes. They describe changes, right? So, and they describe the energetic qualities of movements, not the movements themselves, and not even the movement vectors, but how they feel. So you can do the, you can do the same palm strike, and it can manifest the energetic quality of eight different trigrams and feel totally different upon striking or moving somebody. And if somebody's in front of me and I touch them, I can demonstrate this very easily. And so this basically breaks apart most systems. And that's very interesting. That is something that nobody, I actually have not had the chance to write about this yet, but here I am, this is the first time I'm talking about it uh, out of, outside of my school. Most systems of martial arts are just one or two things. So, for instance, Wing Chun expresses primarily uh, two trigrams. Trigram of Li, which is trigram of fire, 
which is very sticky fire like think think about like, like the the flames that jump from one tree and branch branch to another in a forest fire fire is sticky and hard to get rid of has all sorts of qualities like that and wing chun is sticky and hard to get rid of right. and and gin which is mountain which creates borders and blocks you from moving inside of the certain perimeter so that's one and uh, bjj is a martial art that's uh, heavily focused on the idea of gin the trigram of mountain also essentially the joint locks many of them especially on the ground are borders like how do you create borders and move people around the border and there's a whole thing to it you know it's it's sort of um a mindset that you have to learn it's not that difficult to explain i can basically explain to anybody in about that like one and a half two hour talk once you understand it, it changes your martial arts completely because you look at every movement and now every movement can have totally eight totally different expressions in terms of its energetic qualities and and also different movements tend towards being more of a different quality for instance this type of movement okay so even whether you you're taking someone's arm down whether you strike in the face this type of movement lends itself more to the trigram of water because the weight flows mm -hmm. whether it's like that or like this it's like a crushing wave right it's like a crushing wave even though it can be done more windy this is a oh, wind yes. wave so this is like in tongue train the way the way yeah. you you do this right this might be a little bit more wind rather than water water even though this also exists in Tonga Trains, it could be heavier. So that's a little bit more water to it, a bit more wavy rather than snappy. Okay, but nonetheless, this is a movement which lends itself better to water. Um, and certain movements, all movements can be expressed through the prism of all eight gua, all of the eight trigrams, but certain movements are far better expressed through a specific one trigram or two of them. That's a whole new consideration and it changes your art entirely because you have to take every single movement you know and think about. Yeah, so that's all, that was all about curriculum structuring, which people don't even talk about. People don't think about this. And one of the people who've done this most brilliantly in martial arts history was Ed Parker. That's why American Kenpo is so successful. People think, oh, it's because Ed Parker was a good businessman and he was charismatic. And that's also true. He was a good businessman. He was charismatic. He was a good teacher. But look at the curriculum structure. He knew curriculum structuring. And he wrote manuals for his students. I wrote like a 30-something page basic manual for my students. How many teachers write manuals for their students? Explaining like the rudimentary things they need to understand. And books. I mean, okay, not everybody's an author, but at least put in like a basic manual. Like here's the system. Here's the structure of the system. Here's the curriculum. How many people even hang the, like I hang the curriculum with my school. How many people actually hang the entire curriculum with everything that's in the curriculum, including every single drill, everything on the wall and point to student like you're here, you're learning this, you're learning that. That's very important that I started doing this you know, many years ago. I found that very few people do it. A lot of people even say like, why should the student know? They're like, why, why shouldn't they know? Like, what's the point here? Aren't you trying to teach it like, why would you keep something from them? Like, it's not a, it's not a kung fu movie. Right. They're probably not got like if if you think they're gonna like try and kill you in ten years, why are you teaching them to begin with? You know, right. it's ridiculous stuff. Yeah. Anyway, so I was talking too much. Like, how about you you share with us, uh, Bill? You know, some of your thoughts about all that crazy stuff we've been talking about. Well, no, I think that's brilliant what you're talking about. And I think it's really important, you know, that uh, we, especially in internal martial arts, if you want to use that term, you know, we'll use that for a lack of a better term, kind of at a point where we have to have more modern teaching methods if we want these things to not only survive, but evolve. Uh, so I, I like that you're taking that approach to it. And that kind of brings me to my next question. You've you've trained with a lot of different people and a lot of different styles, and you train a lot of different students from different countries all over the world, uh, in your opinion. Uh, and you may have already answered this with the talk that you just gave. Is what, what do you find that it's most missing 
uh, in not not just the way that teachers are teaching, but in students, like as far as their attitude, what they're bringing to martial arts. You find something that's like a, a common denominator amongst people today that you feel is lacking in their approach to their education? Man, I could write a book on that question alone. <laughs> it's just, uh, there's so many things coming up my mind right now. I mean, first of all, most people are fucking lazy. That's you know, I tell, I tell my students, look, when I practice, yeah, you could see me, like I, t I tell them, like you could sometimes see me on the verge of crying or literally having a teardrop or two coming down my eyes because it's so painful because I push myself so hard and I'm yeah. not talking about deadlifting a thousand pounds. Yeah. I'm talking about just the sheer agony of twisting your body in such a way that forces it to change over time, which is so very difficult because you see, um, and I would, I would digress here, but it's very important. Now, the human skin, human cells change all times so they, they die and they regenerate right? right so skin cells are rather quick you know within a few hours the skin changes the muscle cells are also rather quick in three months you would have changed on average if you're healthy three months you would have changed all of your muscle cells that's why people go to the gym they train hard after three months everybody can tell oh you went to the gym you know if right. they haven't been training before people can see okay tendons the the sum total of all of your tendon cells in your body have changed on average every three years skeleton seven years right. it's the longest so you want to change your bones it takes a long time it takes a lot of pain a lot of effort and you really have to if you want to really be a traditional martial artist you need to change your marrow you know you think the most yeah. internal facet of your being you need to change your bones your tendons in your bones and that requires a lot of effort and a lot of pain people don't want to put themselves in that pain they like the comfort zone they like their comfort zones yeah because we live in a very hedonistic society so that's one problem and you'd be surprised you know i have a student for instance great guy i love him and he was an infantry man and he went for some stuff in infantry that even I didn't get to because I only did infantry boot camp. He he had like a full three-year service. He was even like a platoon commander. And the guy is not willing to push himself out of his physical comfort zone to the level that I would expect him to. Right. Not even as a martial artist, which is peculiar. Because back in the day, it was like, um, must have been 20 years ago for him. Yeah, 20 years ago. He pushed himself much harder than he would now. And he's not that old. Yeah. This is that's only 38 years old, right about. And he's still in pretty good health. He's not obese or anything. Hmm. But he got used to, you know, the comforts of life. You know? Yeah. Nice, quick food deliveries, cozy sofa, you know, easy life. Doing a, a relatively sed sedentary job. A great guy, good student, he's making decent progress, you know, over time. Re really, really wonderful fellow, but he's not pushing himself as hard as, as he can. And he's proven that he can. So, people, and, and you know what? A lot of it is self pity. A lot of it is self pity, and people don't talk about it enough. Like, I tell them, just stop pitying yourself. Oh, I'm so miserable. Oh, life is so difficult. Oh, I work so hard. Give me a fucking break. Right. Work so hard. How many hours? Like right. People work eight hours at the office. Now, the thing is, if you have a job you don't like, working eight hours can be hell. Yeah. I'll give them that. I'll right. give them that. that. That's for any person. I, I have, I do what I like. I, I, you know, I practice traditional Chinese medicine. I practice and teach martial arts. I write books. I love all of it. So I have 15 hour days and I rejoice yeah. and, and I and I have great energy by the end of the day because of my practice, of course, in part. Also herbs. Good to take Chinese herbs, but you got to know what, what the hell you're doing. So um, I would advise anybody, anybody to take Chinese herbs, but please, by all means, just 
have a practitioner who knows what they're doing prescribe you the herbs right. but, but then take them take them because I, I think one of the secrets for like successful martial arts training uh, for most people if if your life is is stressful and most of our lives are stressful in the modern day you need some support it's right. not cheating right we're not doing sports okay that's not sports you're not you're not taking herbs to to gain advantage over anybody you're taking herbs to improve your quality of life. Okay, and herbs are wonderful. And people, human beings have been using herbs for dozens of thousands of years. It's our cultural heritage all over the world. In the West, we have forgotten it. China still remember. Use their knowledge, take herbs. Right. Okay, then do it safely. Have a, a qualified practitioner prescribe the herbs. But they, like, my advice, like, take it or leave it. Anyway, I'm thinking... So much self pity because of these eight hours, you know, doing things you don't like, or you might, or you like it, but you would rather do something else. So you have some in you know, a fight with your spouse or whatnot. And I'm like, ah, oh, life is so difficult. Let's let's order that sushi and not put in like the extra hour training. Like I would wake up in the morning, I would train, I would teach two martial arts classes, then I'd go, go give two sessions of twina, eat walk for like three hours on, on a book and then go train another two hours. And people are like, oh, you're so dedicated. Like, well, it's just habit. It's habit. I feel bad if I wouldn't do it. Yeah. I'm anxious to do it. Like after three hours writing the book, I really want to continue writing the book because I like that as well. Writing is probably my favorite pastime, but I, I feel like I get this itch, you know? And I'm like, am I really going to stay at home in the evening? I'm not going to. And for years, like the, the way I got to where I am now, I don't know, might not be as advanced or uh, as skilled as some other people, but where I am now, the way I got to it is I didn't cut me any slack. People would say like, oh, let's go out with friends, blah, blah, blah. And I'd say, no, haven't put in like the three or four hours of training that uh, I decided that I would put in today. So no, first they train, then we go. And if they can't go out late, too bad. Not good enough. Yeah, I lost I lost a lot of fun because of that. I gained a lot of life experience, skill, health. So that can be done. I mean, gotta be dedicated. Look at Arnold Schwarzenegger. Look at his life. I mean, I read both his biographies. There's one from I think 1975, one from a few years back. A wonderful audiobook, by the way. He reads the first and last chapter. Interesting guy, Schwarzenegger. And um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not keen on his politics, especially not in COVID times. So won't get into it. But um, very interesting guy. A lot to learn from him. Yeah. And this person was dedicated. Yeah, this very person, strong work ethic. Yeah, this person would wake up in the morning, eat breakfast mm -hmm. early. I think it's six. When he would eat, he said he had to make sure that his body has had a good relationship with food. So he would, at the time, they had the you know, wide phone. So he would basically take the phone cord out of the socket. So nobody would be calling him while he's eating and sit for 20 minutes, half an hour, and just eat and focus on the food and growing, growing, mindset, growing, 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 growing. Then he'd go to the gym two or three hours later and it worked so hard that Sometimes he would vomit that food. Yeah. That's work ethic. Yeah. Now you push yourself to the edge. Sometimes you go a little bit over the edge, but that's what you need to do. I mean, in martial arts as well, I, you ought to try to not injure yourself. But I, I've had, you know, a few mild injuries here and there from just um, going a little bit overboard with the training. And it's just the, the nature of, you know, pushing yourself. You got you to do that. Otherwise, you, you, you're you not out of your comfort zone. Right. I mean, if you if someone's listening to this, here, here, here's a tip. If you've never cried from pain during training, it doesn't have to be stupid pain. It doesn't mean you have to punch the wall. I'm not talking about that. Doing things properly with proper, accurate, slow, slow technique. If you haven't cried from pain, then for most people, that means you have never trained hard enough. And I'm not being crying like, oh, this is right, yeah. so bad. It's like, I mean, just, you know, a teardrop or two coming down because it's so freaking painful. So, I mean, can you push yourself? 
to that? Of course you can. You just pity yourself. That's why you don't do it. That's why you will never be as good as you can be. I'm not saying you'll never be good. You, I mean, you. if you train 20, 30, 40 years, you're going to be good if you're consistent and you train frequently, but you'd never be as good as you could be. Now, that's something else. Yeah, so that's the, the, the pity myself mindset. Also, the spiritual stuff, I mean, not every martial arts teacher is a spiritual person. Not every martial art is a spiritual practice. And if you need a spiritual practice or faith in your life, the martial arts that you study under a certain teacher might not always be the right venue. Sometimes you need, just need to get your spirituality elsewhere. And don't try to just stick that spirituality onto the teacher if, if they're not interested in it, you know? Don't make them into a saint, into a magician. And don't fall for the magicians, you know? I see all those people, like, I remember this ridiculous thing I saw once. Um, Steven Seagal, who's a legit martial artist, but a little bit of a circus clown, you know, yeah. over the past 20 years, probably. <laughs> uh, dude, like, eat less. I know, I know you have access to really good food there in Dubai, but come on, man. Go on a diet or something. You're a martial arts teacher, like, uh, and honestly, people, there are amazing martial art te martial arts teachers out there who are overweight, but it doesn't have to do with that. I mean, give a good example, you know, to your students. Anyway, um, I'm saying, um, so I saw Steven Seagal, and he was sitting on a on a chair, and he put his arm like that, and there would be this little Japanese guy. The Japanese guy is like maybe five foot four, or five foot five. And Steven Seagal, I think he's like six foot four, six foot five. Right. So the, the guy is trying to lift his arm. He's like, yeah, I can't. He's trying to go underneath, lift the arm. And, and I saw this ridiculousness. I came to class that day and I showed him the video. And I said, I don't even know how he did this. And part, part, pardon, there's some noise here. There's children in the house, not my children. If they're my children, they'd be quiet. My future children. But these kids are unruly. So... I don't even, I told the students, I don't know how he did this even, but I'm going to be sitting here on a chair and I'm going to have every, every single one of you come and I'm going to put my arm like this. Now I'm going to show you that we can do this circus trick. It's like, oh, I move my chi, I move my this, this and that. And they can't lift their arm. Even the strong guys. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Yeah. You just have to align your structure correctly. So you put all your body weight on the arm, and then they can't use a liver like an arm to lift all of one's body weight. Yeah. You know, you, you have to be incredibly strong to do that to somebody. It's like not strong on the level of most martial artists, strong, like strong on like strong men athlete strong to lift someone, just grab their arm and lift them with a liver like an arm, like lift, you know, a few dozen kilograms like that. Right. And so these are circus tricks. And my contention is, if you've, got, if you've got good martial arts, you don't need circus tricks. Right. And some people are good martial artists and they still use circus tricks, which is unfortunate. But if you have good gong, like uh, Sigong Henry, Sigong is in, in um, Cantonese, that's the equivalent of Shigong. It's teacher's teacher. Right. So that's Sigong Henry Puyi. Master Henry is the teacher of my Sifu Sapir Tal in Southern Mantis. So he would often say, well, how did he say? In good Kung Fu, you don't see the movements, you see the, um, the techniques. So you, you don't have to be fancy. You, you would see through how people apply themselves in the context of a martial art, that this stuff works. You don't have to use circus tricks. And if you use it, it's either just marketing you put on top of what you got, but for most people, it's just circus acting. And it's shameful for most of us martial artists. It's very unfortunate because it misleads the public. And that's why I refuse, like, people come, like, ah, oh, we're going to see that child in circus that came in town. I'm like, no, I'm not going to see that crap. People doing these silly circus tricks where you put the spears against their throats and whatnot. Okay, I'll take the cold steel spears that they sell in the United States yeah. and I'll butcher those bastards, okay? 
that they ain't gonna work. It's all circus tricks. Right. And I refuse. I I wholeheartedly refuse to watch any martial arts being played like circus tricks. When people disrespect martial arts, for instance, there was this series, shitty series, that I didn't watch, called Iron Fist from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Yeah. And, and the guy, the main, the reason I didn't watch it was I saw an interview with the guy, the main actor, and he said, I don't know any martial arts. And frankly, like we didn't even have time to, for them to teach me. So they just taught me a few moves just before the scenes and I said, you're so disrespectful. I'm not going to watch that. That was terrible. Yeah. Yeah, and as opposed to John Wick, for instance, with Keanu Reeves, who's a very legit martial artist, who is essentially killing himself to like filming those scenes. Nice. Extremely dedicated. Maybe the most physically dedicated actor in Hollywood right now. You know, that's something else entirely. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I could go on and on for hours on this topic, but these are just uh, minor examples. So unfortunately, we're almost out of time. Um, but something that I wanted to ask you before we start wrapping up is, uh, wh where do you, what do you see as the future of our traditional Chinese martial arts in the West? Where do you, how do you think it's going to evolve from here? Do you think that the, that uh, internal martial arts are sort of on the rise in popularity? Do you think it's fading away because of the rise of MMA? What do you what do you see as the role of internal martial arts, the future of internal martial arts in the West? I realize it's a broad question. But... I have an, an interesting point of view on this topic. So it's getting more. Okay, so two two avenues for this. So it's one is. It's getting more and more popular. Some of it. Other, other ways, it's getting more and more ridiculous. And we we would we we are far from seeing the most ridiculous stuff, you know. We have yet to see Zuckerberg teaching people on the metaverse. And that's coming. That the, the ridiculousness of it all is, is gonna get worse. But my overall point of view about this is funny enough, my estimation is she's just an idea estimation I'm, I'm not sure that i'm right here most probably tr real traditional chinese martial arts are nowadays about as popular as this they've ever been now what, what do you mean by that if you look at the numbers we could actually say well traditional chinese martial arts have never been as popular because there are literally hundreds of millions of people who practice taiji training mm -hmm. but most of them are just going through motions that they think are taiji training and essentially doing this uh, mild calisthenics that's pretending to be taiji training was actually formed by a committee of the chinese communist party right. which is a long story onto itself that we're not right. going to get into from that point of view traditional chinese martial arts are more popular than ever and they're going to get even more popular but if we're talking about the real traditional chinese martial arts which are still extant and there are ma many people doing real traditional chinese martial arts i mean most of them are either just not that well known or even underground there are a lot of underground schools yep. people who just have you know a handful of students up to five ten students even less nobody's heard about them very few people know about them and the, the, the more you're in the martial arts, you, the more you discover people like that over time. They just want to be left to their own devices, you know. But um, not just these schools. There are also many public schools who are most excellent. But in terms of the, their percentage within the population, I would suppose it's actually unchanging. Because I think the percentage from within the population of people who are serious about stuff in general, yeah. remains similar throughout history. Absolutely. So, so, so then you, you we would say, yeah, yeah, at one point we'd have one billion. And like, if the if the Earth's population it, it grows large enough, uh, which we don't know if that would happen due to all sorts of reasons associated with Klaus Schwab and Bill Gates that I won't be getting into, but. Um, Assuming like if we got to say 30 billion people on earth, just an hypothesis it, at some point, then maybe it would have out of 30 billion, maybe 1 billion of them would have already practiced 
some type of Chinese martial art. Perhaps it potentially, I mean, we're practicing. I mean, also the situation with Tai Chi Chuan. It's not that 300 million people are practicing Tai Chi Chuan right now. 300 million people have been in the Tai Chi Chuan class that would be more accurate, right? And so, yeah, it would be quote unquote more popular than ever. But the percentage from within the population who are doing the real traditional stuff, hmm, I wonder, yeah. probably similar, similar to how it was before. And, you know, what do we call traditional Chinese martial arts? That's a, also a, another interesting question. And do we call, for instance, what I do, Tong Buddha, uh, the way of synchronicity, the synchronous way? Do we call this a traditional Chinese martial art? Well, this has to do with, you know, what makes for traditional Chinese martial art and traditional Chinese teaching, this whole model of Shifu to the, you know, when a master and apprentice. Again, I'm not, I don't consider myself a master. It's just a, um, the way you, 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 describe you know that type of relationship in the english language you know master and apprentice and the i the connection with confucianism and taoism and the different steps and stances which are typical of traditional chinese martial arts the combative philosophy the health orientation which exists within them and then all of the the unique sub characteristics which are typical of um traditional chinese internal martial arts which you haven't gotten to talk about but is a whole family in its own right within the world of Chinese martial arts. So there's a lot to it. And I think if you retain the inherent connection to traditional Chinese culture, and that, is, that stands at the core of what you teach, then yes, it could be called a traditional Chinese martial art, even if it's a quote unquote, a new style. Even though I, again, I wouldn't say that uh, what I teach is new exactly because I have actually invented very little. I'm mostly restructured. And I, I do have a few little innovations here and there, but overall, I am basically, you know, just a, a little midget sitting on the shoulders of giants, my own teachers and their their own predecessors. And so I'm, I'm just trying to contribute the little that I can um, in the span of my generation. I think you're definitely making a massive contribution just based on things that I've read of yours. Uh, I, there's there's so much in there that, you know, we can, I hope that we'll have many more of these conversations in the future. Sure, um, sure thing. If you're willing. But uh, before we go, is there anything that you have coming up that you'd like to promote? I, I, I believe you've got some more books coming out this year. Is that right? Or you plan to have some books coming out this year? No. Well, as I said before, you know, man plans, God laughs. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I have a few books that I, that I was hoping would come out like a year or two ago already, but then we had COVID and, and other issues. Yeah. Issues. Um, I do have a book that I would be completing within about two months' time. Unfortunately for English-speaking listeners, um, this is a book in Hebrew. So years ago, I wrote a book called The Analects of Tianjin. Um, I think this was this may have been my first book. The Alex of Tianjin came out even before Research of Martial Arts is a, is a book in Hebrew that I'd written for my students. I wrote them a few dozen articles about the martial arts in Hebrew, and then I amalgamated and compiled those articles into the form of this book, The Alex of Tianjin. And a few months ago, uh, I took this old book of mine, which I haven't touched for about six years, and I greatly expanded it. So it is by the time it's published, again, within about, few month, uh, within about two months' time, it's probably going to be in the upwards of 850 pages Wow! in Hebrew. And it's a free book. It's always been a free book. And I'm going to release it as a free PDF for the Israeli martial arts community. Now, also, as a form of ad advertising and marketing for our school, uh, our organization, actually. So um, happily for me, this is in Hebrew. It's always easier to write in your native language. Um, but it restricts the, the audience. But um, thankfully, I mean, about a third of the contents in that book are taken from my English articles and books. So um, about a third of the contents are available for the English speaking readers. And my articles are freely available online. Like you can go on, my, on our website, um, www.bluejadesociety, blue like the color blue, jade like the stone jade society, like society, bluejadesociety.com. 
And then there I have a listing of most of my articles about the martial arts and other topics. So you can see them and as well as most of my books. Then following that, uh, hopefully by the end of this year, but I'm being optimistic, um, there is a certain biography that I've been writing for the past five years of a very famous internationally renowned martial arts grandmaster. I cannot name him here yet, though a lot of people already know who that is. And um, he's been helping me out with this project, but uh, overall it's it's my doing and um, it's going to be the upwards again of over 800 pages, most extensive biography ever written of a uh, martial artist was probably either in English, Chinese or any other language. Uh, in, and that book's going to have over 400 images as well. Wow, incredible. Yeah, so th that's, that's going that's gonna to be quite an exceptional piece of work, especially, I mean, I, I think one's best works, like in the martial arts, is when you apply yourself to it for many years. And o only research of martial arts is a book of mine, which I've worked on for five years. The biography is the only other one. And it's just the nature of describing, you know, decades of someone's life and career is just so nuanced and complex that it took a very long time to collect all the information and the person's still alive. And so things are actually progressing as I read the book. Um, hopefully, maybe by the end of this year. Uh, and then there are some other books, you know, down the road. Uh, I, I have about probably 12 potential book projects I'm working wow. on at any given time. A uh, few of them have got over 300, 400 pages already. But it's just a matter of time until you know it's the right moment for me to to get to them and press on the gas and, and really accelerate the creative process to get them out there. Oh, it's incredible. I envy your energy. That's the martial arts, my friend. I mean, um, really, the internal martial arts are uh, what provides us with a connection to our hun. Mm -hmm. um, and hun is one of the five aspects of the the spirit in traditional chinese thinking chinese philosophy and chinese medicine and i view the hun as the reincarnating soul as the facet of our spirit which the greeks called the daemon and the yes the um, romans called it the genius the word genius comes from this so genius is the latin word for daemon which is where the, the word demon comes from, but de, it's it's written D-A-E-M-O-N, daemon. So the daemon or the genius or the hun in, in Chinese is the uh, ethereal component of the spirit which reincarnates and is what we call the soul. Yeah. And as I believe in reincarnation, not from the Buddhist point of view, but generally speaking, I think that um, the practice of, a general practice of internal martial arts help us connect with our home. It expresses differently in different people based on who you are, but essentially for me, it has opened up uh, a flow of creativity which is boundless and endless. And so I can sit down at the keyboard and as long as I have food, water, and sleep, I can just keep writing. There's mm -hmm. no end to it. And I think for, for some someone else that would be with music, as I can see behind you, uh, you're, you're pretty handy with plants. So everybody's got the, the, their their thing going on. Yeah, it's true. It's true. All right. Well, Jonathan, we're out of time. Um, I hope to speak to you again soon. Uh, thank you very much for being here today. It was a great interview. Uh, can you stick around for just a second? Yeah, sure. Bill, thank you so much for the opportunity. Oh, I, I appreciate it sincerely. And I think we should have more genuine conversation, not just you and I, but us martial arts practitioners and teachers with one another so we could better understand and study the wisdom of the generations which each of us holds within their own lineage or tradition. We keep to ourselves too much and there's a lot that we can share. I agree. All right. Thank you, Jonathan.